The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So today I'd like to uh, give a talk. I was asked on uh, by people in Sri Lanka, a supporter in Sri Lanka, in Colombo, uh, last uh, to give a talk for the Ajahn Brahm Society in Sri Lanka. And uh, I gave that talk last Friday on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. And it was a very suitable talk in a way because it, the talk was uh, to address or look at um, the difficulties, the tensions that are building up in Sri Lanka between the Buddhist community and the Muslim community. There's seemed quite a few tensions throughout the world between the Muslim community and other communities. And we can see in New Zealand a very unfortunate result of that with the massacre in uh, Christchurch of the mosque uh, playing out. So this talk, as, as the Friday talk did too, will focus on harmony in, uh, in society and ourselves because harmony is a very important aspect of the Buddhist path. It's a, a factor that leads to peace within uh, and it's, a, it's a, something that promotes the uh, practice of the Dhamma. So I'd like to just uh, start, I think because there's not so much time now, I might abbreviate what I was going to talk about. And just to, uh, to mention this, these verses, I was going to quote some verses from the Buddha. Uh, and this is what happened at uh, Kosambi when people were in... Uh, uh, in disharmony. <laughs> when the monks were in disharmony, actually, they were having a big fight. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And this is some of the verses the Buddha spoke on that occasion, which are always, you know, they, they, they really sum up what happens when we have disharmony in the world. And it said, the Buddha said, when many voices shout at once, none considers himself a fool. Though the Sangha is being split, none thinks himself to be at fault. They have forgotten thoughtful speech. They talk obsessed by words alone, uncurb their mouths, and they yell at will. None knows what leads them to uh, leads him to act so to act. And of course, as I mentioned, this is at Kosambi, um, where the uh, monks had divided into two groups. Because of course, disharmony is always a number of groups. It can be more than two. Can't it? <laughs> it can be many. And uh, they had divided into two. One was the group that was focusing on Dhamma and one was uh, focusing on the Vinaya. And there'd been a small uh, Vinaya offence, uh, a rule of discipline for the monks. And this split the community. And the Buddha was invited to come and uh, heal this. And he did, uh, on a number of occasions, speak to the monks. But the occasion that I'm going to mention here, which is in a sutta, from the Majjhimini Kaya called Imperfections. Um, he talks, he is invited to come and speak to the monks and he said to the monks, stop arguing, stop quarrelling, stop uh, hurting each other with verbal daggers. And you think, well, they'd listen to him, you know, he said this three times actually. And then uh, one of the monks said to the, the Buddha, he said, may the Buddha not involve himself in this. May he have a pleasant abiding, which means to to go off and meditate, especially the jhanas, the deep meditations, and that they, these monks who were disputing, would be solely responsible for that. And so then the, the Buddha, um, he, he saw that this was not possible to, uh, for him to um, heal this. And so he, the next morning he went on his arms around and left Kosambi. He left those monks. It's very interesting because it shows the Buddha um, doesn't, is not coming from the sense of being owning the Sangha, I'm controlling the Sangha. You see that, don't you? That uh, he, he does what he can do and then he walks away from it because he realises with equanimity, not the right time. <laughs> and of course the Sangha being split, he talked about in that verse, is you know when the, the monks or the nuns, fully ordained monks or nuns, divide into two groups and uh, therefore there's not unity, there's not harmony. And this is one of the most serious things that, the, that, uh, hap that can happen in, uh, in the Sangha is when the Sangha is split. And uh, the, um, the Buddha mentions quite often the very negative karma that when the Sangha is split. But the 
harmony in the Sangha is so important for, and it's one of the things as a monk or a nun it was impressed on us, you know, this harmony of, of the group working together is so important because without it, there cannot be peace. Without it, the practice will suffer. We can't practice the Noble Eightfold Path so well. It's an obstacle. And also for the lay community, when the Sangha is uh, fighting, as in Kosambi, you know, this place where the, uh, the monks were fighting, disagreeing over Vinaya, it also reduces the faith of the community, the lay community, because they think, wow, these monks, what are they practicing? Look at them. <laughs> they're supposed to be peaceful, and they, they, they're, uh, they're actually fighting each other. And the way the, the dispute ended was because the lay community stopped feeding them. <laughs> Very practical, isn't it? <laughs> Very practical. <laughs> and also what it points out too is there's a lack of respect from the, uh, uh, towards the Buddha that they wouldn't listen to him at all because they're so taken over by the dispute that they were having. But we see in the world that there's many divisions in the world uh, and this is very natural given the fact that we have uh, the three negative roots in our minds of desire, aversion, and delusion. This is very natural. And it, it plays out particularly in, in uh, dis these sorts of disputes is a lot of anger can come up, hatred or a strong sense of self or ego. That what, that's what can come up. So this is, and I reflected, as many of you probably have reflected too, the US elections were a pretty good example <laughs> of disharmony uh, and people dividing in a huge way. I couldn't believe it, how polarized America has become over the uh, elections. And it reminds me, as it probably reminds you, of the, the maxim or the saying, divide and conquer. And I think politicians often use that, that uh, to gain power and to keep it. And they can even, you know, in politics, of course, they can use a particular group within the society as a scapegoat, focus all the negative energy on it. And that happens. We see it, we've seen it in... Uh, with the Jewish people in Adolf Hitler's Germany before the Second World War and during it. And it reminded me, you know, when I see, see this division in society, one of the phrases that came to mind, it shows how conditioned we are, united we stand, divided we fall, <laughs> came to mind. And so I Googled it, as you do, and uh, I wonder if you know who said that. Did anybody know who said that? I'll tell you what Google said. They said that it goes back to the 6th century BC actually originally, obviously not in these words but in the Greek or whatever, but evidently one of the founding fathers of the US in 1768 wrote a song called the Liberty Bell and this, this phrase was in it, it's in the active form, United we stand, uniting uh, we stand, dividing we fall. And so it was in a song, but I realised that that's probably not where I got the reference from because I saw there was a pop song in 1970 <laughs> called United We Stand, Divided Before. And I saw it and I saw the words and everything. I thought, yes, I do remember that. <laughs> so that's probably where it's coming from. But the causes, where is that? One of the causes of disharmony, you know, lack of harmony in the world. And one of the, in the society, and we can see because of that disharmony, you know, there's often intolerance. This was one of the phrases that was, uh, mentioned about Sri Lanka at the moment towards the Muslim community. And of course the immediate cause for uh, division is, a, is views, different views that uh, people have and so people divide over these views. And I've, uh, one of my teachings in the last few months or the last six months really has been on the emphasis on views to be wary of them because they're so powerful and often dangerous because they shape our lives, they shape the way we perceive the world, they shape the way we think. So this is quite a, a, a good thing to be on the lookout for. And sometimes when you say views, people think, well, what do you mean, you know? But racism is supported by a view, isn't it? There's a view there that some people are superior, some people are inferior, that idea. Discrimination based on gender, sexism is based on a view as is religious and uh, sexual orientation. Coronavirus, we've seen so many views. And these conspiracy uh, theories, they really um, have highlighted how views can affect people and how people can really um, believe in them and give them power. But for the Buddha, 
all these views are wrong views. <laughs> so. And why are they wrong views? That's, that's uh, the useful thing to consider. And I think for all of us, it's always good to have a measure of our views, you know, whatever we believe to see the effect it's having on the mind. But for the Buddha, a view is wrong if it's not taking us to awakening, if it's not taking us to enlightenment. But it's also a wrong view if it's based on desire, uh, aversion or delusion. So these are the areas, if we want to check up with a view, is this view enhancing my life? Is it enhancing other people's lives? Just to check where it's coming from. And sometimes it's not easy because, you know, when we believe a view, there's a lot of self invested in it, a lot of ego. So of course we think this is absolutely true and it's so important and therefore we can override um, our sense of, you know, uh, you know, can allow anger to come up and things like that. But of course, wrong views lead to consequences because I often, I thought, you often hear the Buddha talk about uh, the, uh, the wrong, wrong, noble eightfold, wrong eightfold path, it's not noble, <laughs> wrong eightfold path. But when we have a wrong view, we'll have wrong intentions. So we'll think of getting or uh, we'll think of uh, ill will, of aversion, we'll think of harming others and so this is the motivation then from that motivation the speech will come wrong speech we'll speak harshly we will speak what's not the truth we will speak uh, speech which divides people and we will speak uh, gossip actually which can be very negative as well not only from that from that wrong intention wrong speech wrong action can arise so people will kill other people for a view they will steal they will uh, i don't know about sexual misconduct depends on the view <laughs> and also then we, get, then we have wrong livelihood wrong effort uh, and wrong mindfulness and wrong samadhi or wrong stillness unification of mind so this noble this eightfold path the wrong eightfold path is quite powerful in the world you see it so I'd like to talk about more about what the Buddha, how the Buddha uh, recommended we develop um, harmony. Because lovely, actually, this is based on that uh, dispute at Kosambi and from that sutta, the uh, imperfections. And I think it's a, uh, it's a very good one to, um, to show how we can develop harmony. I'll just read, after the... Uh, the Buddha left Kosambi after this dispute, realizing he couldn't do anything with the, with the monks at that, that stage. He could not speak to them, um, could not get through to them. And so he left Kosambi and he traveled, uh, he actually spent the wasa in a, the, uh, this is a range retreat, in a forest on his own. But on the way to that forest, Parilekia forest, he uh, met some monks and one of them was Venerable Anuruddha, Venerable Nandia, and Venerable Kimbala. And one of the things he said to them after the, f the first few introductory comments are, I hope, Anuruddha, that you, you are all living in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, blending like wa milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. And then Venerable Anuruddha said, surely, Venerable Sir, we are. But the Buddha being the Buddha, <laughs> he asked, but Anuruddha, how do you live thus? Because that's, that's interesting. How do we live in harmony, blending like uh, milk and water? I think in the, the Bible it's more like blending like milk and honey, isn't it? Something like that. I think that's what I remember anyway. And Venerable Anuruddha said this, and it's a very useful thing for us to, to uh, reflect on. He said, Venerable Sir, as to that, I think thus. It is a great gain for me, it is a great gain for me that I am living with such companions in the holy life. These are the other two monks. <laughs> I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness towards these venerable ones, both openly and privately. I maintain verbal acts of loving kindness towards them both openly and privately. I maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards them both openly and privately. I consider why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do? Then I set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do. We are different in body, venerable sir, 
but one in mind. Isn't that lovely? It's very nice, beautiful, actually. It's a very soothing and um, uh, ideal, in a sense. It's very idyllic. <laughs> so, but they were also, you know, uh, practicing monks. And, and uh, I don't, they say that they weren't enlightened at this stage, awakened, but they're certainly on the way to it, I'd say. So what does it mean? It's a gain for me. It's a great gain for me. This is a very important uh, part of harmony, is actually to, to have this gratitude and thankfulness for the situation we find ourselves in. It, because often we can focus on the problems, the difficulties, the negative things that uh, exist in the situation. And of course, that won't be perfect. So there will be uh, difficult things. But when we develop thankfulness for the bigger picture, the, uh, the good things in the situation, in our relationship, in the family or in our society, then it makes us appreciate what we have. It makes us, it, it, it makes us aware that there's more to it than this, this problem. The problem looks pretty big, <laughs> but when we look at, uh, when we're thankful, we're looking at the bigger picture, we say, ah, oh, there's a lot more to be thankful for. And so it prepares the mind, develops the mind for loving kindness. It makes it soft. And, and uh, one of the terms I like for loving kindness is friendliness. So, so it's very easy when we live together to take each other for granted and uh, uh, to be critical of each other. So this gratitude or thankfulness really balances it. It helps us to bring up a more positive, uh, wholesome uh, view of each other. And so we keep in mind that these faults, these problems are minor compared to the, the things that uh, you know, are, we're thankful for. And so the acts of friendliness, you know, this is uh, or acts of metta. Uh, I maintain bodily acts of friendliness towards the, these venerable ones, both openly and privately. So this is uh, very important for because when we're thoughtful of what other people's needs are, it can be very helpful. It can be, it's appreciated, it goes to the heart because it, you know, when we do something, maybe only a small thing, you know, even a smile, or, you know, whatever it is, a good morning, <laughs> good afternoon, it, it can go to the heart and be really appreciated. So we can do whatever we can do for, other, for ourselves, for others, um, you know, cleaning, gardening, washing, whatever it is, and giving gifts. These are acts, bodily acts. A go to the heart. You know, when we give a gift, Christmas time is a time traditionally of giving gifts. And it means we're not thinking so much about ourselves. We're thinking about what others need and it reduces that selfishness we have. But the important thing the, he said, mentions, I don't know if you noticed, not just in public, but in private. How do you do things for others in private? Well, you may do things that you know need to be done they're not around, you do them. And this is what happens in a monastery, ideally. And this brings harmony uh, to the community, to the family, to the society. But what I wanted to focus on, because metta is obviously the, the uh, metta, loving kindness, friendliness, is what um, the, the uh, Venerable Anuruddha is talking about, which can heal, can bring harmony, can reduce disharmony. And so, and I always remember Ayakima, she said that this uh, metta, friendliness, loving kindness, is the supreme emotion. So it's something to really develop. And it is that sense of friendliness, because it comes from the word mitta, which means friend. And it has a sense of warmth and goodwill, uh, well-wishing, gentleness, harmlessness. Um, and it ideally is unconditional, so we don't pick and choose who, <laughs> who we have this... Uh, friendliness towards and uh, we don't expect anything necessarily back in return and of course the purpose of this uh, uh, developing meta what why do we develop it because it deals with a lot of or addresses a lot of the negative uh, mind states that cause disharmony for us and lack of respect so it bring reduces ill will annoyance irritation resentment holding on to grudges, anger and hate, etc., harming and hurting, it reduces fault finding, all these things. So it's a very important thing for us to develop if we're going to live in harmony in the live in harmony with ourselves too. 
because often the divisions can be within ourselves. We hear people have saying, I'm having conflicted emotions. So we need, very much we need to have metta, loving kindness, friendliness towards ourselves. But it's something that we can share. Once we have it, we can share it with others. So that's very important that we have developed it and then we can share it. If we haven't developed it, then it's very hard. Well, it's impossible, isn't it? <laughs> To, to share if we haven't got it. It's like somebody who wants to uh, give someone a donation of money or give some money to a person and they haven't got any money, can't give. So it's very important that we develop it. But the point is that anyone can develop uh, loving kindness or friendliness. It's not something that uh, is impossible for anyone. We all have that seed and we can develop it by cultivating it, by repeating it, by uh, bringing up this feeling. It's very important that when we talk about loving kindness, we're talking about it conceptually, but it is a feeling. It's a feeling of warmth, of friendliness, of, uh, that's incredibly positive. So we just need to develop, when we say develop it, repeat it, and make it uh, a habit that we've developed in our lives. And some of the ways we can do that, and people use words, don't they? They use words, may you be happy and well. And words are fine if, only if they bring up the feeling of loving kindness, of, of friendliness. The, the only thing with words too is that you have to keep changing them because if you keep using the same words, it will not have bring up the emotion. And they have to be something that connects to the heart that brings up that feeling. And we can use images, of course, images are good. So um, I know Aya Kima, one of, one of the images she used, you can use many different things actually. It's like the sun in the heart and it's filling one with this warmth of friendliness, of loving kindness, and it's banishing the dark inside. It's relaxing, filling the, the, the body and the mind with this warmth, this friendliness, and then we can radiate it to others. We can use also visualizations of pets are very good. People, people are very much, uh, they've got a, lovely, a lot of loving kindness or friendliness towards their pets. Uh, you can see that quite often, whether it be dogs or cats. Ajahn Brahm, he uses kittens, he uses kittens, but whatever works. And that's the point, it has to be something that brings up the feeling. And it's, you have to be a little creative with it. You can't use the same thing again and again. I say it's like uh, chewing, chewing gum. If after a while, it loses its flavour. <laughs> it's the same with these techniques. You have to keep uh, reinventing it. And one of my favourites, and so maybe we can do a short guided meditation with it, is uh, using the reflecting on the qualities of a best friend. So if you'd like just to close your eyes and come into the present moment. And just to reflect for a moment on the qualities of a best friend. What's a best friend like? Someone we feel close to, someone we feel connected to someone that understands us, that's warm, that's there for us, many things. And we can fill our bodies and minds with this feeling of friendly, being a best friend, being a best friend to ourselves. so that it brings healing, relaxation, joy, contentment and acceptance. Just enjoying this warm feeling of friendliness, the best friend. And we can 
radiate it to all those here in the hall, all the beings here, this friend and this being, regarding them as a best friend, with this warmth of friendliness. And then we can spread it in ever-widening circles all of, around the center, continuing, continuing, until we cover the whole earth and all realms of existence. And now we can come back to ourselves, very short, <laughs> and slowly open our eyes. So I hope you, you were able to, to experience some taste of metta, that feeling of friendliness, a warmth, ease, relaxation that it brings. It's very good. We can use it like a medicine for these difficult mind states we experience, you know, grumpiness or tiredness, whatever it be, whether it be physical or mental. And we can use it in a meditation to, for, the, for the body, to relax the body, for the present moment, for the breath, or whatever object we're using. So it's a very important aspect of, uh, um, for meditation as well as our everyday life. So this is talking about acts of uh, friendliness and then the uh, Venerable Anaruda mentions the friendly speech I maintain speech which is friendly towards my companions in the holy life both openly and privately and speech is actually what drives a lot of division for us and this speech um, can cause a lot of misunderstandings and causes can cause hurt too and the Buddha I love one of these sayings the Buddha um, uh, Gave. He gave many wonderful sayings, but one of them is, we are all born with an axe in our mouths. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? It's quite good. So the important thing for us to do, of course, is to develop uh, right speech, speech which is friendly, kind, gentle, and warm. Um, so this is both, interestingly, in, in, he says, in private and in public. So in uh, private is when we're talking to other people, not to the person we have a problem with. And one of the uh, very nice uh, um, quotations I'll give about right speech, is just lovely actually, and it emphasizes this harmony, um, uh, which is uh, the, the focus of this talk. And he says, uh, this is not from Venerable Anuruddha, this is in the, uh, the Majjhimini Kaya, the Middle Length Discourses to Kandaraka, and it's uh, Sutta number 51. Abandoning false speech, one abstains from false speech. One speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable. One who is no deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, one abstains from malicious speech. One does not repeat elsewhere what one has heard here in order to divide those people from these. Nor does one repeat to these people people what one has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus one is someone who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendship, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord, abandoning, this is the next one, a harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech, he speaks or one speaks such words that that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable, as to go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. And abandoning gossip, one abstains from gossip. One speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. At the right time, he speaks. One speaks such words as are worthy of recording, reasonable, 
moderate and beneficial. So that's lovely, isn't it? That's really nice. That's the right speech to develop the speech. Let go of, you know, lying, let go of malicious speech, divisive speech, harsh speech, and let's let go of gossip. Develop those very positive aspects. But he also mentions developing thoughts and feelings that uh, I maintain mental acts of friendliness towards them, the other monks, both openly and privately. And of course, this is what we do when we practice metta meditation. But of course, we have to take it into daily life too. And when we find ourselves in daily life, to bring up this feeling of metta can be very, very helpful, especially when we need to relax, we're in a difficult situation. It can be very, very useful. So basically, Venerable Anaruda is saying we need to develop it 24-7. <laughs> we need meta by what we do, what we say, and what we think, and what we feel, because that's the other aspect of it. But also the uh, other point that he makes in this, his, uh, how, how they, uh, the point that he makes about how they blend like uh, milk and water is this too. He says, why should I not set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do? Then I set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do. And this is often uh, the difficulty in when there's disharmony and conflict. We, we don't think like that. Um, we, we don't think we will put aside what we want to do. And I think uh, often it, uh, this, this is where you know, the ego comes in, our self comes in. And uh, we think something is very important. But as I say, we need, whether it be in the family, uh, whether it be in society, in a group family or society, we need to look at where it's coming from. You know, And if it's a negative, uh, it's coming from a negative motivation, then we know this is not part of a spiritual practice. And that's the important thing with uh, uh, spiritual practice. The result, the goal is, is not the main thing. It's how we get there. People always say the journey, isn't it? They say the journey. But it's very true. It's the means we use. So I always feel if the Buddhist society, if there's some event that is, doesn't work out as planned, you know, people may say it wasn't a success or whatever. As long as they did it, if we did it in a good way, with a good heart, I feel that that is a success because we are acting in a spiritual way. So this is always, in the end, is the uh, most important thing, where we're coming from. Uh, and that makes it a spiritual practice. And so I say, you know, in the, in the West too particularly, we're very individualistic. So this can be a sort, it's very hard for us to live in communities. This is why for Westerners and living in uh, Buddhist monasteries, as either as monks or nuns, this is really part of the learning process because it's not easy for us. We're used to our own space and living in community can be really uh, a challenge. So this harmony that we uh, are looking for, to, looking to develop is very important. We need to, of course, we need wisdom to determine what things are we need to stand our ground on. And there are things that we do need to, that we can't compromise. But usually if these things uh, that others are suggesting are not immoral, not unethical, then uh, it can, uh, compromise is possible. And I'd just like to, to, getting close to the end actually, just to mention a couple of other factors that the Buddha mentions in another sutta. Uh, and this one is called uh, uh, well, Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it cordiality, which is an English word that I think is not very common. It actually translates as friendliness, <laughs> which is quite easy. And he says there are six principles of friendliness that create affection and respect and conduce to uh, co cohesiveness, binding together, non-dispute, concord and unity. What six? And he talks about developing a friendliness, metta, through body, speech and mind, in public and in private. So that's what we've already spoken about. But these things are very, very important too. Um, you could say this is an act of, uh, this is a, an act coming from Metta too, that uh, again, it says here, a monk shares without reservation any lawful gains, anything that is offered, even his alms food, he'll share with others. And this is, this is giving, giving, sharing, a uh, very important way 
to create harmony in a group. You see it, and hopefully at Christmas it, <laughs> it has created harmony in the family. And uh, certainly the shops are very happy with it. But <laughs> but uh, so giving a gift is a very, very useful way that can touch the heart. And that's actually an action. So generosity and giving, are, are, they can be a form of, of friendliness, of loving kindness, can't they? So and it promotes the harmony. And so the other thing that the Buddha rec uh, recommended for creating this sense of uh, harmony too was that the, uh, the monks dwell to, together openly and privately, possessing in common with his fellow, their fellow monks, virtuous behavior. So if we have the same ethical standard, same moral standard, that can be a great way to bring harmony. Often in a larger society, there's different, different um, degrees <laughs> of morality or amoralness or whatever it is. But within, uh, if we can have a similar code of morality, that's very, very useful for people. We know we can trust the other person. It gives rise to a sense of respect, it gives rise to harmony, of course, and peace, and it, it gives rise to respect and reduces conflict. So these ethical values in common, very important. And that's why in uh, modern society, this tends to be breaking down. There's no agreement you know about ethical standards and the last one the buddha mentioned is that again a bhikkhu dwells both openly and privately possessing in common with his fellow monks a view that is noble and emancipating this is lovely which leads out for one who acts upon it that's interesting to the complete destruction of suffering so this is talking obviously about you know right view that takes us all the way to enlightenment um, but it highlights the fact that in a group, to bring harmony in a group, if we have a view or a belief in common, that can, that can be very, very useful. Uh, it can give us a sense of shared purpose and it can give meaning uh, to our lives. And as I say, it brings a sense of unity and harmony as well. So these are the, uh, the Buddha says, the six principles of friendliness that create affection and respect and conduce to cohesiveness, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. So this is some of the ways the Buddha is recommending for uh, developing this harmony. Basically, loving kindness, loving kindness, loving kindness. <laughs> but also, you know, these uh, other ways too of having the, the sharing, giving, and also ethical standards in common and a view or a purpose uh, that is in common too. Because today this, the views and purposes that many people have are so diverse, <laughs> so diverse. So these are things that can bring harmony in a group, bring harmony in a family, bring harmony in a group, bring harmony in society. So I'd like to finish there just to, uh, um, to open up to any uh, questions about that. It was very fortuitous actually in a way, you know, I had this talk requested about harmony from Sri Lanka. And I thought, well, it fits with Christmas too, you know, because, you know, at Christmas time, we, uh, harmony is a part of a family gathering. You know, hopefully when people get together at Christmas, they are, har by and large, harmonious. And that harmony brings a sense of peace, connection to people and happiness as well. Because if there isn't harmony in a society, if the society is divided, it, it, it makes life very difficult for everyone, actually. And I think that's what we're seeing in America, <laughs> seeing in America. And one of the things that was very impressive with the COVID-19 here was that, by and large, you could say people uh, were, um, harm were in harmony with the, the, the direction, the view that we needed to work together. And they did it, by and large. There were protests and, and things like that. But uh, it was a good illustration of harmony and leadership as well, I must admit. The leadership <laughs> helped a lot. So we did very well here in, in Melbourne particularly. And I know friends in Canada, they say, Melbourne, Australia, is, is, is you know, t uh, people say this is a model for how to <laughs> deal with COVID-19. So this is quite, quite impressive actually, especially when we see the disarray in other countries, you know, admittedly, they have big populations.
big, big populations. So now I'd like to just finish there and just to ask if there are any comments or questions, complaints uh, about harmony or anything else indeed. Um, yes, yes, Gora. All right, that's good. We have the live first, shall we? Yeah, we can uh, maybe online. start with the online questions. All right, all right. Um, Thanks, Juan. Sorry. What is the difference between harmony and no discussion? My family doesn't want to talk about our pressing issues, right. however I bring up. Oh, right, right, right. And what's the difference between harmony, harmony and uh, not... Uh, and, uh, not discussing um, issues. I think that's a, that's a very good question because harmony doesn't mean that we all agree. It can't mean that, you know, but we respect each other's difference. And also when we have these discussions, you know, of issues within the family or, or, or within a group, within a society, you know, we have to come from um, an, uh, a feeling of loving kindness, not, not, not trying to blame the other person, being able to listen to the other person and to accept respect. Because this is one of the important aspects of harmony is there's respect for the other person's opinion. It may be different from ours, but we can under... Uh, sometimes I find it very interesting when I hear some people's views and things like, my goodness, I'd never have thought of it like that. <laughs> but uh, so it can be, you know, this, this respect for other people, uh, their views and the way they see the world. You know, we have this, it's, it's challenged a lot these days with people with conspiracy theories. You know, they can believe in these conspiracy theories. And I read that friends of people that have that subscribe to one or another of these theories, they, they can't talk to the person about it because they'll, you know, end up in an argument, which is terrible, you know. But if you can respect the other person, you know, even though you may not agree with that view, then that can bring harmony. And as I said, it's where we're coming from that's far, far more important. You know, not being right. We think we're going to be we're right. They think they're right too, actually. <laughs> so, so this is the important thing at the end of the day, that we're really there to listen to the other person and to accept the differences between us. And that, that is how harmony is achieved because it's, harmony is not that we're all going to be the same. You know, that's impossible, you know, and unless you do some sort of extraordinary brainwashing that we all become sort of like robots. That's not going to happen. So this is, you know, part of life, the differences. And it's very important in a family or in a group to discuss things that are issues. I think that's, one should feel safe, one should feel um, encouraged to do that, you know, because uh, that can lead to growth. And to do it in a way that is positive, because we feel like we're doing it for the benefit of the group, for, for, the, uh, for the other person that we're talking to, or the family, family members we're talking to so that we can, you know, achieve that harmony, you know. Good, thanks. The very word that I wanted to use, that the greatest gift a friend can give is the capacity to listen. It is. Mm -hmm. And yes. I think this is a, one of the best ways of having creating peace in any group, mm -hmm. is to be able to listen yeah. and keep the mind fairly open. That was all. Yes, I think that's good. Thanks, Cora. Keeping the mind open too is really important, you know, because we can do that by by knowing that the the, the really important thing is, you know, the the qualities of the mind of the heart that we're coming from, they're coming from, and uh, so this is really, you know, how we develop the spiritual life, the inner life. So no, that's very important. Important. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, that's good. I think. Mm, yeah. Mm. But it's, some, it's a quality that's emphasised a lot in the Buddha's teachings and particularly in the Sangha, you know, you see it again and again. The Pali word for it is samaga. It's very similar to the uh, uh, similar word is, I think, samagi? Samagi. samagi. And um, so it's a, it's a really central principle. But if you look at the Sangha, of course, you see this so many disputes, so many disputes. This is the one that I talked about is a big biggie. It was a very big dispute, but there were so many disputes going on. So the Buddha heard it all, 
but he was emphasizing because of that, you know, that uh, developing this harmony because then we can, as you say, listen to others and also b make it a part of our spiritual practice, not make it a part of our, our defilements of getting angry with people or getting annoyed, irritated with them or, or developing more of an ego out of it because that can happen, you know, so this is, this is the point of it. So it's emphasized and on the way down, I remembered um, the way here, I remembered Harmony Day, I thought, and I was saying, is Harmony Day to do with uh, the uh, Aboriginal people, the Indigenous people who live here? But uh, uh, Aya Santa looked it up, Google. <laughs> and it's to do with multiculturalism, you know, the fact that we are a multicultural society. It's very diverse, and I think that's a, um, a part of, of respect is respecting that diversity and that richness. Looking at diversity as richness, you know, the differences between the, the different uh, communities that make up Australia. And this is wonderful. And this, is, this is looking at the differences between people. So this is great. And to promote harmony about it, not to use differences to create division, which, which uh, can be the case. So very good. So may we develop Harmony Day, have more Harmony Days, every day. <laughs> may every day be a Harmony Day. So very good. So any other comments or questions? One more online question. Oh, all right. Here's John. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Juan. I'm not sure whether this related to Harmony. No, it doesn't matter. The discussion, no. But this one question is, how do Pacheka Buddhas practice Will they also be like monks and practice Buddha's teachings, or can they be like lay people? Ah, that's interesting, yes. I never really thought about that. Uh, Pacheka Buddhas, you know, because they are Buddhas, you'd think that the, the form of their practice would be similar to a Buddha. So it would tend to be the, uh, the same uh, sort of lifestyle that a Buddha would have. They would tend to... Um, leave the home life. They live in uh, maybe in a forest in a remote place, and uh, they would be, um, you know, developing these inner qualities of of peace and wisdom. They'd be developing the four noble truths, wouldn't they? They'd be developing those. They'd be living ethically. Um, they'd be relying probably on people's gifts, offerings, um, and. Uh, they say with the Pacheka Buddha, this is, if for those who don't know, this is someone who um, doesn't teach as such or doesn't pr uh, create a teaching which continues on. I'm sure Pacheka Buddhas would be teaching uh, people who came to them to give offerings, but I don't think they, they, their teachings don't become established. They don't develop a Sangha. Uh, they, they've understood the Dhamma, they've become enlightened by themselves, and, uh, but they d don't establish a, a community of monks, Buddhist monks and nuns, a community of laymen, laywomen. So this is what I understand with the Pacheka Buddha. But they've seen exactly what a Buddha sees, and so anybody that sees that will tend towards uh, renouncing the world, we say, leaving the world, leaving the home life, and living um, a very simple life, usually in the, in the forest or something like that, somewhere near a village. Um, so it'd be a very similar lifestyle to a to a Buddha, but just not teaching like a, a sama some Buddha. This is somebody who can teach a, a fully awakened Buddha, who can teach and establish uh, the Dhamma, establish a sangha of monks and nuns and the lay community as well, lay men, lay women. So I think that's how I would, would expect it, you know, that uh, it would be fairly similar. Because I've seen exactly what the Buddha saw. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Nice to see you. Oh, the microphone, that's right. And there, um, I found during Christmas that the younger generation talking to the older generation, mm -hmm. sometimes the words... I don't know whether it's our generation, but it tends to be a bit more blunt. <laughs> oh, right, yes, yes. <laughs> And I found even myself on Christmas Day t to my mother, I had to tell her to sit down. Oh, right, yes. And yes. some people from outside thought it was very rude of me to speak 
in that manner to my oh, mother. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. But my mother's one who does a lot of stuff. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I find as the daughter, even yeah. though her cousins or her family yes. may think it's okay, as her daughter, I know she has to sit down yeah, right, to continue sometime. for the next couple of hours. Yeah, take a rest. So <laughs> I had to be a little blunt and say, yeah. you need to sit down yeah. now. <laughs> oh, but that's coming from kindness, isn't it? It is, but I, I find that, yeah, sometimes yeah. from outside you're giving the wrong impression as well. Like from yes. the outside people think you're being very rude and yeah. very aggressive and very... <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> People can misinterpret things, can't yes. they? That's that's the thing. You know, <laughs> perceptions that we can have of, of different things can be completely wrong. You know, sometimes we can see something and you can say, "I saw it, I heard it," <laughs> but then you then you find out a bit more. Oh, right, it's like that. All oh, right, <laughs> because you know, if 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 those people who were perceiving it like that thought, "Oh, all oh, right," because your mother, she's getting older now, so so it's she can't she can't she hasn't got all the energy she used to have. So better to sit down, reserve a bit, build up some strength, and then uh, then she it'd be good for her health. And uh, yes, no, I think that's that's often the the the, th the thing that happens with uh, conflict is misunderstanding. You know yes. where people are coming from, but always for a Buddhist, you know, we always say the most important thing is to know where we're coming from and take. A refuge in that, you know. It's, I had a good intention. However, people received it. Well, I can't control that, you know. And so that's natural. So, but you know, you had a, a feeling of concern, and I think that's that's wonderful. That's very positive, you know. So if people, I'm sure your mother would have understood it too. She probably saw that. Yeah, she, she probably thought, "All oh, right, she's right." Actually. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes people need those little little uh, prompts to allow them to, because otherwise they'll keep going and then overdo it. We say overdo it, and often you only know you've overdone it when you've gone too far, and you think, "Oh God, I feel really drained." <laughs> so that's I think it's a kind thing. So if we're coming from a loving kindness, if we're coming from concern for a person, compassion, uh, or joy for their good qualities. Um, and, uh, then this is a, these are wholesome things or acceptance sometimes too part of harmony is accepting the, the fact that this is equanimity actually <laughs> it's an emotion of acceptance that they're like this at the moment you know so and uh, but they won't always be like this whatever that this is like and that sort of acceptance has got this warmth in it as well you know knowing that we're all works in progress and uh, that uh, you know we are like this at the moment, but we won't be permanently like this. So, so this is a, a part of it too. So they're the four um, supreme emotions, as uh, Ayakema used to call them. You know, so loving kindness, compassion, joy with others' success or good qualities, and equanimity or acceptance. I call it a lot of the time. Mm. So thank you. And now I think it's thank you for that. I hope it was hope helpful.